It has been theorized that Saturn and Jupiter are considered brown dwarfs. What's、mm. a brown dwarf? A brown dwarf is considered by astronomers to be a failed star. It didn't quite make it,、uh, so it doesn't have、um, much in the way of nuclear reactions going on, if any, in the core,、uh, and therefore it's just、uh, cooling down from its natal heat. And that natal heat is supposed to be due to accretion. Now, as I said, in the electric universe model, all of these objects of various sizes, from planets up to brown dwarfs through Uh, bright stars are formed in the one event, and once that fades, then each one adopts whatever、uh, appearance is suitable for its new electrical environment. Because the Birkeland current doesn't go away; it, it's still there.、Uh, we can tell this by the、um, the very fact that the sun is surrounded by things which were predicted by the electric universe model and are a complete mystery to、uh, conventional astronomy. Now these brown dwarfs, so-called failed stars, are considered now by astronomers to be、um, the place most likely to harbour life with close-orbiting planets because they're they're cool,、uh, but they would be able to keep life、uh, or even begin life on、uh, satellites which were nearby. You know, you would be rather closer, more like the moon to the Earth than、uh, us, 93 million miles away from the sun. Now, astronomers recognised with the gas giants that they were more or less at the bottom end of the brown dwarf range, and when they found out that Jupiter and Saturn were radiating, still radiating heat, this idea seemed to be、uh, quite reasonable. So I think that's why they said that、uh, they were brown dwarfs. But the Electric Universe model has a,、um, a more interesting story about them. Because if you were to take Jupiter or Saturn and put them outside the heliosphere—that's the boundary of the sun's electrical influence—they would light up in the circuit that drives the sun. They would become brown dwarfs. Yeah, this is one of the other things. Out in deep space, there's energy coursing everywhere, electrical energy. So the idea that、uh, you know it's black and cold, and、uh, if we were out there, you know, we'd be doomed, is incorrect. <laughs> What can you tell us about the European Space Agency Rosetta mission to study Comet 67P, and what it revealed about the Electric Universe? Well, the Electric Universe has had big success in predicting what would be found、uh, when comets were visited.、Uh, some years ago, when the Deep Impact mission was begun、um, and it was announced, I predicted what would be found, and I was correct on every issue, including one in particular, which was totally unexpected by anyone else. And that was, I predicted an electrical flash before the main outburst, and that was exactly what happened. Now, Wired magazine picked that up and、uh, ran a story on it, and I was in the U.S. at the time, and Time magazine、uh, from Sydney in Australia rang me and said they wanted to do a story on it. So when I got back to Australia, I got in touch with the、um, the person writing the story, and they said、um, they were sorry that it had been somebody had stopped it. I expect they sent it to an expert. <laughs> yes, beware of experts.、Um, the other aspect of it is that I predicted that the outburst would be far more energetic than expected, and that was true. In fact,、uh, the original aim of that、uh, flyby and the copper projectile that was fired at the comet was to see the crater and see how big a crater it made. Well, the outburst was so bright that、uh, the cameras failed to、uh, pick up the crater. The suggestion at the time to explain that、uh, flash before the the bright outburst was that.、Um, The comet had a, a crust, which the、uh, projectile had burst through, and then buried itself deeper, and then everything had come out. Well, the、um, the mission then was to try and get the spacecraft to go back past the comet and have another look, and that was done、uh, eventually by the Stardust Next mission.、Um, and when they flew past and had a look, they could hardly see a crater. It was difficult to pick anything out. And that I also predicted because comets and asteroids and all of these other bodies in the solar system, 
in the electric universe model are the result of uh, readjustment of planetary orbits on the entry of a new body into the solar system. Because once you understand gravity, uh, you understand that um, capture is much more easily uh, achieved by electrical interchange between bodies and between the body and the sun. And any body which is uh, entering the solar system will become a giant comet. And that cometary discharge is what circularizes the orbits. And this is with the problem that Velikovsky faced. How do you explain Venus's near circular orbit uh, so soon after human witnesses saw it as the archetypal comet in the sky, a frightening uh, apparition in the sky? And that's the answer. It was a giant comet. It was discharging strongly, and the discharge was adjusting its apparent mass and gravity continually until it adopted a circular orbit. So um, it all kind of uh, fits together. The other aspect is that the jets on comets are not due to water sublimating, they're due to electric discharge machining. And I think the idea that Comet 67P was a, a dusty ice ball, you know, fluffy ice ball, uh, led to them planning and implementing a set of harpoons they were going to fire into this uh, comet when the lander, the Philae lander, uh, uh, touched down. I'm glad those harpoons didn't work because it would have shot them, <laughs> the poor uh, lander back into space uh, because I said that it will be a piece of a planetary surface because when you get planets in near approach, each one has a plasma shell around it. They call it a magnetosphere because the magnetic field of the object is trapped within that plasma shell. It's like an insulator between the, the object, the planet, and the sun's environment. But if you get two planets come close enough together that their plasma shells touch, all of a sudden they can see each other electrically. It's like uh, suddenly there's a, a wire between them, and of course that means that you can get an interplanetary thunderbolt. And this is where the name of the uh, Thunderbolts project came from, because Velikovsky's work was based on... Um, human testimony and he used a forensic technique which hadn't been applied before to human testimony from around the world to establish uh, beyond reasonable doubt that uh, the idea that Venus was a comet in the past was correct. He may have made a tactical error in trying to revise history on the basis of it but uh, <laughs> uh, if we just concentrate on that evidence alone that that should have been uh, taken seriously by astronomers and investigated because it meant that Newton's law wasn't applicable in these circumstances or there was something about Newton's law that was variable and the thing that's variable in Newton's law is the gravitational constant now I don't know why it was ever termed a universal constant because it was measured on earth but by making that one error to say that G is a universal constant, uh, we estimate the wrong masses for planets, we estimate the wrong mass for the Sun, we estimate the wrong mass for Comet 67P. So although it was um, thought to be, and also by the orbit of the, um, the spacecraft around it, seems to be uh, less dense than water, about a third the density of water, in other words it should be fluffy, it looks like a piece of rock. And the reason is it is a piece of rock. It's just that uh, its big G is much different to that on the Earth because big G is an electrical variable. In fact, in mathematics, it has included amongst us dimensions of length and time mass. And mass, as we know in a particle accelerator, is an electrical variable. So mass is energy. Yes. If you apply energy to a particle, its mass increases. And so... On a planetary surface, if you change the charge on the surface, you change the energy stored within that body. So it all fits together. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the gratifying things, that there is so much information coming back from uh, all sources uh, that uh, fit the Electric Universe model that um, I'm able to do. Uh, space News, as they call it, on the Thunderbolts.info uh, website, uh, I'm run off my feet sometimes, one or two a week. But we have other scholars uh, in the in the Electric Universe group now who um, also contribute. And the 
the beauty of all of this is, and I think this is the attraction of these conferences to many people, they come and they say they've never been to a conference like it, is because no subject is taboo. And as long as somebody can draw connections with the electric universe model, you can speak about uh, biology, particle physics, you know, geology, astronomy, anything. Because any real cosmology can have no exceptions. You have to be able to accept data from everywhere. If you can't do that, you haven't got a real cosmology.